this morning and to be here. I want to thank you all for having me. Um, I know one time I was wor working with a congregation in Kentucky, and it was, it was probably the first week I'd been there. I was only there for a summer, but it was Saturday night, and I'd gone to the mall to pass out Bible study invitations. So I was passing out these Bible invitations, and I don't know if you know, but Saturday nights are kind of heavy mileage nights at the mall. <laughs> And so there are a lot of people who are very busy engaging in their commerce and they didn't really want to think about Bible study invitations and so they were kind of looking at me like I was from some other planet or, or something weird. And uh, I just, I went home that night with that impression. I was kind of uh, bummed out, you know, and when I got to services the next morning, I walked into this congregation that I hadn't really, you know, I'd been to before but hadn't really spent a lot of time with and instead of looking at me like I was an alien, everyone looked at me like I was a brother. And that was such a great feeling. And the real blessing to it is that you can travel all the way across the country, go to the southernmost tip of our, of our nation, I think, and, uh, and find a congregation of brethren who look at you the same way. And it's a real blessing to be here. And if you read this morning's bulletin uh, article about family, that plays into this sermon as well. At Southside, where I've been preaching for about two years, we about once every six months take up uh, sermon requests, and these can be anything. They can be a, a word, they can be a question or a topic, um, they can be anything. And usually at, people don't include their names on these sermon requests, so every once in a while I get one that I don't quite know what to do with. And this one was one of those, that, just a question, what is a Christian? You know, what is a Christian? And yeah, I thought about that because, you know, I've preached sermons that are five points or five steps to being a Christian or, or you know, you've probably heard sermons that are like ten things that a Christian life is about or, or 75.3 things that are included in Christianity, you know. So we, we know we know what a Christian is. There's a broad variety of passages you could go to to learn about what a Christian is and who a Christian should be. And, you know, a simple answer that we'll look at this morning is a Christian is a, a follower of Christ. And so as I looked at the sermon request, it's really a simple question. I got to thinking, well, what would someone who requested this sermon not have heard in a sermon before? What are, what are they missing that they need to hear about this morning? And to look at that, I'd like to, you to turn to Luke 14, where we'll be for a large part of this morning's lesson, Luke 14. You know, because it's a simple question, what is a Christian? But you know, even as, as I have grown up in, in the churches of Christ, I don't think that I'd heard a lesson that very plainly, very simply, just said, when you leave this building this morning, this is how you should feel. This is how you should act. These are the kinds of decisions you should make. For the rest of your life, this is how you should think. This is how you should behave. Just simply answer the question of what is a Christian. And that's a bad thing. It's kind of a bad thing that those kinds of plain sermons can be missing at times. Because I'd assume that if you're in this particular building with that particular sign in the yard, that you would, you'd hear that question, what is a Christian? You'd go, well, Tom, you know me. I'm a Christian. <laughs> and that, that's true for some of us. But the sad truth is, and it, it brings me no pleasure to say this, but some of us are not. There are some of you in this building today who are not Christians. And that's a terrifying thing to say. That's a sad thing to say. But it's a true thing to say. Some of us are not Christians. And you know, I guess I'll skip the end of this sermon for just, for just a minute and tell you how I want you to leave this building feeling this morning. I want you to leave this building and feel empowered. I want you to leave this building this morning feeling empowered, feeling powerful. And it's not because that's Tom Morris's personal agenda and he came to St. Pete, Florida to give you a feeling of power. That's not why. And it's not because any one of us deserves power, because only God deserves that kind of feeling, that real feeling of empowerment. But I want you to leave this building this morning feeling empowered, because that's how Jesus said a Christian should feel. You know, in John chapter 8, and verse 31, he said to some Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. And again, there's our our easy definition for a Christian. Someone who abides in Christ's word, someone who, who follows Christ is his disciple. But he didn't just end there. He didn't just stop there. 32 comes next. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple and you will know the truth. 
Isn't that a blessing in itself? Amen. There are so many people who spend their lives truly believing that there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as real truth. <laughs> it's relative. Everybody gets their own take on the truth. And it's an enormous blessing just to know, just to believe that Christ's word is truth. That must be torture to live with that question for a lifetime. And we don't have to suffer that torture. And the reason it's so torturous is because what Christ says next in verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It will set you free. And if you never know the truth, you never know that freedom. And that's a beautiful, beautiful, empowering thing. Just think about freedom. You know what? I don't know, but the first thing that pops into my mind is our nation. We live in a nation where freedom is, is the greatest of virtues. You know, freedom is what it's all about. And you know, we might think what the, what the Jews in that context thought. They thought, we are children of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone, which of course was not, was not true. But we might think, well, you know, what, what really are we slaves to? And in that, again, in that context, Christ makes a deeper, a deeper application. You're a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness, and clearly you'd like to be a slave to righteousness. That will get you to heaven. But you know, we, don't even, we can even take it and be purely physical and still understand that we need freedom. You know, for, for example, let me give you a couple examples. I, I would guess that most of the people here have some form of employment, or at least have experience with having a job at some point. You know, some kind of job. And you may have loved your job. You may still just love your job. It might be the best job you've ever had. But aren't there days, maybe even just minutes of days when you're just like, oh, I can't stand this job. Oh, I want to quit this job today. You know, the truth can set you free from that. We think about peer pressure. Most of us think that peer pressure, that ends in middle school, right? But... You know, anybody with, <laughs> with uh, children or parents or brothers or sisters or any kind of family knows that there's times when your family or your friends try to, try to convince you to do something you may not want to do. Maybe something that's wrong. They influence you to do something that you just disagree with or aren't, aren't particularly excited about. Sometimes maybe you, your family drives you a little bit crazy. You know, the truth can set you free from that. But most importantly... And most significantly, the truth can set you free from yourself. You know, if you're anything like me, you've sinned. And that sin has consequences. If that, sin, if that consequence is nothing other than your own heart that pricks you every time you think about it. Or maybe you even have a self-destructive characteristic. You really get to rolling on something or succeeding with something, but it just blows up at the last minute. Maybe it's a sin that's so shameful, you, don't, you can't even really confess it to someone you know loves you or someone you know would never stop loving you or change the way that they think about you or, or hold your, you know, if God forgives you for that sin, so can they, but it's so shameful you can't even admit it to them. Or maybe it's one of those really shameful sins you don't even want to think about God replaying in judgment when he goes over your life to say, come to me or depart from me, I never knew you. The truth will set you free from that. And that liberty is a powerful feeling. And that's why this morning I say my goal is for every one of, every one of you in this building to leave here feeling powerful. Because that's what Christ can do. That's how Christ said a Christian should feel. But before we get to the power, before we get to the liberty, we have to go over the scary part, and that's what comes in Luke 14. Luke 14 will begin in verse 25. And verse 25 has a phrase that we'll come back to at the end of the lesson. It says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build the tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first thank you, and deliberate whether he is able to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 with 10,000? And if not, verse 32, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now this is a surprising passage. It seems to go against a lot of what Christ teaches. And it's, it's also surprising just because of the general structure. This passage is worded negatively. Did you notice that when you read it? It's, it's a very negative passage, which is not exactly characteristic of Jesus' teaching. Very frequently, he'll take a negative thing and present it in a positive light. For example, uh, he'll, he taught the Jewish people that they needed to get over their hard-hearted self-righteousness and accept Gentiles by telling the parable of the, the prodigal son. And when she taught that there was a, a young man who basically goes to his dad and says, give me stuff, and then he takes that stuff and he wastes it, and he's eating the food of pigs, which was disgusting then and is disgraceful then, you know. And he comes back and he comes to himself and he says, if I were just a servant in my father's house, then I would have plenty of food to eat. And so he teaches this, uh, this negative lesson about this older son who's... who's uh, uh, jealous and, and angry about his son coming back and getting treated so well by, by teaching this positive, beautiful story about a father who watches from far off while his son comes back to, serve, to, to uh, live in his house. And so from that way, he, he teaches a, a negative point with a positive, uh, a positive parable. And the same thing with the parable of the lost sheep. He teaches that there are 99 sheep safe in the fold and there's one who gets lost. And so the shepherd goes out after that one lost sheep and he finds that sheep, leaving the 99 and brings him back to the fold. And the point of that parable is that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 who are safe. That's beautiful. But this passage, Luke 14, that's negative. I mean, instead of saying, this is what you need to do to be my disciple... He says, if this describes you, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot follow me. You know, instead of teaching, uh, teaching, what, uh, teaching these people or feeding these people or healing their sick, he tells them, if, if this is you, you cannot be my disciple. It's kind of a downer. And I want us to look closely at what he says in verse 25. He says, or 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and sister and brothers and wife and children, yes, even his own life. Is Christ contradicting what he teaches when he says you love God first, then you love others, and then you love yourself? Now, I'll explain this passage, but I want, I want you to understand before I do that this explanation does not soften the impact of what Christ says in verse 26. This explanation doesn't make it any easier to swallow. In fact, it sounds better at first, but it makes it more difficult. The word that's used there for hate in verse 26 is not the same kind of word we use for hate today. That word implies a moral choice, a moral choice to esteem one thing over another. So in the context, what Jesus is saying is that you morally choose to value God more than your father and mother, your brother and sisters, your wife and children, and yourself. You know, he's saying you morally choose to esteem it. And a moral is something you do bigger than yourself. You know, for example, um, like loving your family. Any parent knows you can't love your family selfishly. It's really hard to love your family selfishly because children require a lot of sacrifice. So you make that decision to love your children on a moral that's bigger than you. It's not a selfish decision. So this morally choosing to esteem something over another thing. And of course that something is God over father and mother, brother and sister, and self. But you know, that's really hard. That sounds easier, but that's really hard. He goes on to explain this point in these parable-like uh, teachings using this man who builds a building. He says this man doesn't go out and just start stacking up stones on top of stones without calculating the cost because if he doesn't finish it, people will mock him. You know? And that makes sense to us. At Southside, we're remodeling our whole building and uh, uh, we, we're being very careful about how much money we spend because if we run out, then we are stuck in a half-remodeled building. Nobody wants that. You know? And so he uses this, this uh, picture of this man building a tower and says you, he has to count the cost. Or this ruler, I love the word that he uses to describe this ruler. It says he deliberates whether or not to meet this force of 20,000 with 10,000. He's not just saying, 
um, should I do it? He's deliberating. He is wisely considering all the options in this battle and then deciding to go out and to go out and send a message of peace before it comes to his front door. But counting the cost is more than just saying, okay, can I afford, <laughs> can I afford to be a Christian? Can I give up all that stuff? Counting the cost is understanding sacrifice. Counting the cost is understanding giving all of those things up. Not the possibility of it, but the pain of it. And that's why it's so important. That's why Jesus doesn't hesitate to teach it from a negative perspective. It's because it does hurt. It does hurt. There is pain. And you know, if you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, at some point, you will experience that pain. You will have to look at a, chi at a child and say, I'm sorry, you cannot be a part of my family. You will have to look at a, a friend or maybe a parent or a loved one and say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. A follower of Christ must give something up. You know, and, and frequently people talk about sacrifice and equate it with loss. Like, if, if in an effort to do something I lose that thing or something else, that's a sacrifice. But you know, there's a difference between sacrifice and loss. Loss is something taken from you. Sacrifice is something you give at a cost, which means it hurts. You know? And not only that, but we talk about Christian sacrifice. And here are some things that I hear people call a Christian sacrifice. You know, they say, well, I can't drink. I can't drink like all my other friends and neighbors drink. I can't go out and just have a blast and get drunk. You know, I can't drink. <laughs> That's not a sacrifice. I'm sure you and I know plenty of people who live completely healthy and happy lifestyles and never taste a, drink, a drop of alcohol. Or, you know, something, uh, and, and I'm young, so I hear about most of this stuff from young people, and I admit, but, you know, I can't live that party lifestyle. I can't go to those parties like I used to. You know, I can have a lot of fun and not go to a party. You know, probably my favorite, and this, you know, again, I'm, I'm young, I hear this from, from young people, but they'll say, you know, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm just, I'm not going to have sex before I'm married. You know, all of those things that people frequently call sacrifices are so much better when you do them God's way. In fact, those things aren't sacrifices. They're good for you to do God's way. And if we equate those with sacrifice, we're getting those lines blurred. That, uh, that sacrifice is much, much more than that. It's giving up your own life for Jesus. Now think about that for a minute. It's not contemplating giving up your own life. It's not considering the cost of giving up your own life. It's not saying it's a possibility that I might be martyred. It's giving up your life for Jesus. It is morally deciding to choose Jesus over everything you are, everything you were, it's killing yourself. And let that sink in. This morning, I encourage you to think about what you've given up. Think about what you've sacrificed. Because if you're here this morning listening to what Jesus taught, and you can't think of something you've sacrificed. And are you a Christian? Jesus said that there's another part to being a Christian or a disciple. And that is bearing a cross. Bearing a cross. You know, at this point in his ministry, Jesus' followers might not, in fact, likely did not fully understand that he's not just using an illustration when he says, bear your cross. They didn't fully understand that at some point, he would be laid down on a cross while hypocrites and people from outside his nation and the same sinners that he would give up his life for would drive stakes like railroad ties through his flesh. You know, there are few sins today in our culture greater than hypocrisy. But those are the people who nailed Jesus Christ to a cross. 
When he said, bear your own cross, he wasn't just telling them that it's a matter of consideration. When they heard him teach that, they might not have fully understood it, but then they saw him hang. They saw him hang until his blood and water uh, dripped down that cross. And someday, they understood. He wasn't just giving them an illustration. He was showing them how. He was showing them how to make sacrifice. He was showing them that if they wanted to get to heaven, they had to bear their cross first. And you know, every single one of those 11 men who saw him at that time did. They took up their cross. Which brings us back to the phrase that I'd like to focus on this morning in, in verse 25 of Luke 14. The first phrase of verse 25 Great crowds accompanied him. They accompanied Jesus. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. And verse 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate. The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And see, that's what he's teaching in Luke 14. That gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction. And you know why that gate is so wide and so easy? It's because a lot of people will come to that point where they're faced with a cross and they'll say, I don't want to pick that up. <laughs> I don't want to pick that. I don't want to give up my family. I don't want to give up my friends or my wealth or my fame. And anymore, it's, it's more pity, petty things, isn't it? It's pride. Pride is almost always what it is. You know how hard it is, for example, to tell someone that you were wrong? To go, I'm sure, I mean, at some point, I'm sure you've done it, but to go before someone and say, you know what, I was wrong about this. We need to make it right. And, and you know, sometimes that's, that's difficult because frequently in any conflict, there's fault on both sides. And so people get to the point where they think, well, if they'll come and they'll make that right to me, then I will gladly apologize to them. They started it, so if they start finishing it, then I'll finish finishing it. <laughs> But Jesus didn't teach that you have to bear your own cross only if someone else is bearing their cross the way you think they should bear your cross. And if they're not, then you don't until they do. That's not what Jesus said. He said, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and come and follow me. And not many people are willing to put down things like pride or money. Most people look at the cross and look at their lives and say, I would never, never pick up that piece of wood. Look at chapter 13 of Luke. One chapter back from our text. Luke 13 and verse 22. They asked him a specific question. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Verse 23 says, And someone said to him, Lord... Will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive. Let's pause right there at one word. Strive. You know what striving means? Striving is like when you are running, but you are out of energy. But you keep running anyway. Striving is when like you're holding up a weight, but you can't hold it up anymore. I mean, you are exhausted, but you keep holding it up anyway. That is striving. And he finishes verse 24, he says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for I tell you, many will, I tell you, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. And you'll begin, and you'll begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, you taught in our streets. But he will say to you, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets and the kingdom of God. God, but you yourself cast out. Does that surprise you? What he just taught there? That he said there will come a time when people will ask God to save them. And he'll say no. I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of evil. They'll cry out to come in and he'll say no. 
Brethren and friends, I want you to know that that time is this morning. That time is right now. Even this morning, you have got to be ready to bear your cross. And think about what's going on when he teaches these two passages in Luke 13 and 14. You know, he says, they'll say they, they saw him, they walked with him, they ate with him. And all these people in, in 1425 who accompanied Jesus, they had been following him. They had been fed by him. He would just, they'd get hungry, he'd just feed thousands of them, you know. They had seen him heal their sick. They'd bring in sick and he would just make them better. And so they were hanging out with Jesus because of the cool things that he did for them. And that's accompanying Jesus. And I want, to, I want us all to think about this morning. Whether we're followers or accompaniers. If you're here today because of the cool stuff that Jesus does for you, then you're an accompanier. If you're here today because Jesus forgives sins, well, that's, that's pretty cool. That's good. We all need that. Or if you're here because Jesus taught, judge not that you be not judged. Just one of the most out of context passages of Scripture. Judge not that you be not judged. That's really cool. Even the world loves that sentiment. He taught this is a judgment-free zone. It's full of equity and love. And that's really cool. But brethren and good people, if you're here today because of the cool stuff Jesus does, then you're accompanying him. And you see, while I know that not everyone in this auditorium is Christians, I believe just as firmly that everyone here is a good person. And if there's one thing that Scripture teaches, it's that when devout, good people hear the gospel, they gladly change our lives, their lives. And at the end of this lesson, when all of us know what it is to be a Christian, all the good people will change their lives. Change their lives to follow Jesus. And that's why we are, and that's what a Christian is, and that's the good part, the empowering part. Every single person here this morning can take up a cross. In Romans 6, Paul uses the death of Jesus to illustrate the act of baptism. And he says, just like Jesus was buried in the ground, we're buried in water. And just like Jesus rose from that grave to walk in newness of life, we rise from that water to walk in newness of life. And if you're here this morning and you're a good person but not a Christian, that's the moment you need. That's the freedom, the liberation that you need is the moment when you, like Christ, die. When you kill yourself to live for Him. That's what you need this morning. You pick up your cross. You stop thinking about what Jesus can do for you. You stop thinking about the cool things that He does. And you start thinking about how you can serve your brethren and how, more importantly, you can serve God. You stop being an accompaniment and you start being a follower. You pick up your cross. And here's the catch, I suppose. But after you pick up your cross, you have to bear it. Not just hold it. You have to strive to enter that rest. And that means that the rest of your life, you will constantly be challenged. <laughs> You'll be challenged by all those things we talked about before. You'll be challenged by peer pressure. You'll be challenged by your, your, your physical uh, you know, blessings, your money, or, or, or maybe the lack of money. And you'll be challenged by yourself, by your temptations to sin, and even by your own pride. And so you might be here this morning and you had once picked up a cross, but along the line you set it back down. Good Christian, we encourage you to pick your cross back up. Confess a sin. Ask for prayer. Talk to someone you need to make something right with. But pick your cross up. It has no business being on the ground. Crosses were meant to be raised, not lay on the ground. And if you're here this morning and need to pick up your cross, then we invite you to do so while we stand and sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and we always do.